Hey everybody, welcome to this week's episode of the, or edition, if you will, of the PC Perspective Mailbag. Uh, you've got me again for one more week. I think I'll be out next week, so if you have questions for Josh, he'll be filling in. Uh, feel free to leave them in our comments section on this on this video on YouTube and or on our website associated with this video. I do have a request for you all, though. When you ask your questions, try to keep them succinct as uh, trying to distill down a three or four paragraph question into something we can display on the screen for everyone to enjoy is uh, a little bit more problematic. So again, thank you guys, everybody, for your questions. If you enjoy this stuff, please be sure to go to patreon.com slash pcper and show your support there. We greatly, greatly, greatly appreciate it. Let's get to the questions. It'll be a little bit of a shorter episode this week. I'm off to go see Solo tonight, so... Nothing stopping me from going. Let's go. Bill Ostrowski asks, I have a Ryzen 7 1800X that can automatically boost one or two cores up to 4.2 gigahertz at stock speeds. When I try to manually overclock it, the best I can get is 3.9 gigahertz on all cores. Which option is best for gaming, the stock boost or the all core overclock? Uh, so, Bill, you have come across the substantial and frequent problem of overclocking in that, uh, especially once architectures and motherboards and systems allowed us to independently clock cores, there's a lot of trade-offs you could you could go with. Um, you're using an 1800X, and actually this problem is even more complicated or it gives you more options with the 2000 series Ryzen parts where you can actually clock each individual core independently. In which case, I would have told you, well, take take your first two cores and allow them to overclock higher than 4.2, because in theory that should still that should still be possible. I think for your specific case, where you can uh, leave it in its stock configuration, where you hit about 4.2 on the first two threads, I would say it's first two threads. I think it's one core, not two cores, um, versus 3.9. I. It, the answer really comes down to are the games you're playing multi-threaded or not. If they seem to be very lightly threaded, then the benefit of running at slightly higher clocks uh, on one or two threads is going to be more advantageous. However, if your apps are more multi-threaded, then obviously being able to run at 3.9 on all cores is probably uh, the better solution. For me, for my money, I would probably look at this as... Let's get the system in a configuration that is most commonly going to benefit me. And, and to me, I believe that's 3.9 on all cores. It gives you the uh, the best capability to, you know, you're, you're running really fast when a game is heavily threaded and you're running still pretty darn fast within, you know, 8% of your peak when a game is lightly threaded. And I would even wager to say that there are very few games, if any, remaining that are only one or two threads, probably none uh, of the modern games. And instead, you're probably looking at three, four, five threads kind of being the common use case. So I would say, Bill, that uh, I would go with the 3.9 gigahertz on all cores and leave that as your default setting for your overclock. But a very good question. Very good. ZKid1070 asks, I have my PC connected to a 4K HDR TV. How should I configure my output color format? RGB, 444, 422, 440? And what about color depth? 8-bit, 10-bit, 12-bit? What do these settings mean and which will give me the best picture on my 4K HDR TV at 60 hertz? You didn't give me any details on the TV, uh, Z Kid here. Um, or really the, the graphics card, although your name has 1070 in it, so maybe you're using a GTX 1070? I don't know, hard to say. The uh, general idea here is that the higher the bit count of, of your video, you know, 8, 10, 12 bit, the, the better off you're gonna be in terms of peak potential uh, color accuracy that you can produce. And same with your, your, your 444, 422, 440 ratings. Um, you didn't mention 420, which is also a common uh, uh, standard that is used and is actually what some configurations require in order to get you know 4K at a, at a higher uh, refresh rate, like 100 or 120 hertz, for example. Um, asking Ken about this, for example, he said, you know, leave it in its default, let the EDID kind of do that configuration for you. I think that's probably the easiest solution, and most of the time is going to give you the best possible outcome. Uh, a caveat to that is, for example, the Xbox One, I hooked it up to uh, an LG OLED TV, and it 
defaulted to leaving it at 8 bit, even though the TV supports 10 bit. So I manually enabled 10 bit on it, uh, and that worked perfectly fine. What I would try if I were you is to enable these settings one by one and uh, it basically do the thing where you apply the setting and if the TV responds correctly to it, leave it on. And if it doesn't revert back to the to the uh, next highest option, right? So without knowing your TV, chances are it's if it's a 4K HDR and it's a, a reasonable quality level one, it's gonna support probably 10 bit. Um, 12-bit, I don't know if there are any, I don't think there are any really 12-bit capable 4K consumer HDR TVs out there yet. Um, but but uh, you will have to, to, you can either go the default route of letting the EDID do its work, and in theory, once you actually enter into the HDR mode, it should be auto-configuring some of the stuff even above and beyond what you would be anyway. Right, so your PC, like Windows by itself, is not running in HDR mode all the time, which is one of the bigger problems we have with HDR. Is that the the software pipeline uh, through the driver from Windows to the content is still very complex and not um, solidified <laughs> as well as it should be, or well as it needs to be. So hopefully that'll be something that uh, Microsoft and uh, Nvidia and AMD and those guys can iron out. But uh, enjoy it. I have on, on my side. Next question. Igor Palchik asks or says, I want to upgrade my trusty Radeon HD 7970 to the latest high-end AMD card. I know that it's generally better to get the best single GPU you can afford, but should I spend the extra on a Vega 64 or would I get better performance with two RX 480s and Crossfire? Is Crossfire still well supported or is it, or is it effectively dead at this point? So Crossfire, and I'll put SLI in the same bucket as this, is in a complicated spot. With the advent of Vulkan and DirectX 12, the capability for either NVIDIA or AMD to really control the multi-GPU pipeline was taken away or limited to a great deg great degree. Um, in other words, I NVIDIA or AMD couldn't simply fix the game for them in the driver by making uh, tweaks and improvements for Crossfire and multi-GPU compatibility. Uh, on, on one hand, that's bad because it means that you have to depend on somebody who may be less inclined to care about multi-GPU support, especially considering the emphasis on consoles that many developers still give to their games. On the positive side, it does mean that, in theory... Once people start to understand multi-GPU and how to parse content across it, rendering work across multiple uh, graphics cards, it should be a global thing that gets implemented at some point. We haven't seen that occur yet, though. Uh, and you are right in that it's generally better to get the best single GPU you can afford. And I have said that for a long time, even before DirectX 12 and Vulkan complicated things more. Um, Crossfire and multi-GPU have always been awesome, but always had you know a lot of restrictions and a lot of potential headaches. Um, it's why we saw NVIDIA go from supporting three- and four-way globally to only supporting two-way SLI, uh, really, for everything except benchmarking applications. And even that is, is kind of hit or miss. It's not something that's really pushed by the GPU guys anymore. And you know that that's a bad sign because if there's any way they could sell you two graphics cards instead of one, they would absolutely be doing it. My advice here would be, yes, if you know you want an AMD product, you go with the Vega 64, maybe a 56. It's not that much uh, uh, slower than a 64. And though there may be some instances where two RX 580s can perform better than a single Vega 56 or 64, I would say the vast majority of instances you're going to have more headaches with Crossfire than benefits with Crossfire. Uh, and to to get your Vega 64, enjoy the gaming that you can now. And maybe next year, DX12 will uh, automatically parse and distribute content magically uh, across multiple GPUs. I don't think it's going to happen, but maybe it happens, in which case now you're, you're poised uh, to buy a second Vega 64 should you want to go that route. You have a different, different, uh, different landscape, but I don't think it's going to be changing much. In, uh, in the near term. There's a question, question next from Brissa117. 
It says, my current power supply only has four SATA power connections, but I need to add several more hard drives for a free NAS build. Which of these solutions would you recommend? Molex to SATA adapters, SATA power splitter cables, or buying a different power supply that offers enough native SATA power connections. Uh, four is actually a really low number for a power supply to have. I The, the first thing I would say is, uh, is it a high quality enough power supply that you are comfortable with it powering your storage device, right? If it is, and it just happens to be something that was you know low enough wattage that it only had four SATA, which I'm sure has occurred many times, um, Either of those options works uh, in terms of keeping that power supply and getting these splitters or adapters. We have used Molex to SATA adapters many times here. The, the, the Molex connector itself is subpar, I would say. Uh, it, it, they mostly work fine. Worst case scenario that would happen that we would see in our arrays is that maybe the adapter fails or is a little bit loose and the hard drive falls off the array and now you need to you know, reattach it change the adapter or whatever and uh, uh, recheck recheck the array, but you don't generally lose data from that. The SATA power splitters will work. I do, you know, don't split them more than once, that's for sure. And if two of these SATA are on the same, you know, rail slash cable from the power supply, you may not want to split it, each of them, taking two cables to six cables or two power adapters to six power adapters, but going from two to four should be fine. I think the SATA power splitter cables is probably the neater, cleaner option. Um, but I, I, if you happen to have Molex's SATA adapters around, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel bad about about that metric. I don't know how many more hard drives you're adding, but that that would be kind of what I would do. Um, if you worry at all about the power supply longevity, uh, maybe you've had it; it's kind of six, eight years old at this point or something. It might be worth looking at. Uh, some other, you know, 500, 600 watt units that have more SATA connections on them. And if you read our reviews on PCPro.com, uh, Lee goes into great detail about what connections each of these power supplies has. So um, if it's easier to find there than on the on the manufacturer's websites. Uh, another one also from Brissa117 asks, with the incredible increase in memory prices, why have we not seen SSD and flash drive prices soar as well, are NAND and DRAM not fighting for the same fab space? Interesting question as well. It, it is true that they're not fighting for exactly the same lines in these fabs, but they are sharing fab space, right? So Samsung is and, and Hynix and uh, those guys are all making all of this memory. Um, so yes, it makes sense. But Micron is making some of this memory as well. Um, but it's not like uh, they can very easily, you know one day run uh, uh, DRAM through it and the other run uh, run flash through it, right? It it's kind of has to be configured in a, in a specific way. Um, as for why we haven't seen SSD and flash drive prices soar, I think, I think we did for a little bit. We did see SSD prices go up, but I think there's more competition in the SSD market. And there's also other things happening, right? So we've seen TLC flash come out. We've now seen QLC flash be announced. We've seen, um, you know, multi-layer flash come out. So there are other there are other things that are accelerating the cost reductions more than the cost accelerations of uh, uh, of the memory facility constraints. That being said, what I what I imagine is happening is that without these facility and these fab constraints, we would have seen SSD prices drop more, more quickly. So uh, even though we haven't seen prices go up, my guess is that we have not seen them go down as much as we could or should have uh, in that in that time span. So uh, we can still blame we can still blame memory for that, I guess. Another question, this is an interesting one that I don't think I can answer really well, but I is sending me down a, a path of, of interesting reading. David Thor wants to know, why are we not seeing Intel and AMD CPUs with more than one hardware thread? For example, the IBM Power 8 processor is a 12-core CPU with eight hardware threads per core for a total of 96 parallel threads. The Spark M7 is the same with 32 cores and 256 threads. Granted, these are server parts, but wouldn't the Xeon and Epic lines benefit from this? Uh, first of all, you say uh, Intel and AMD CPUs with more than one hardware thread. Both of these do have SMT support, symmetric multi-threading 
or, or simultaneous multi-threading, which essentially gives them two hardware threads per core. Now, that being said, there's still a very big difference between running two threads per core and eight threads per core, which is really interesting. There's a lot of things that go into this, right? So you've got instruction set architecture, you've got just the design of things, you've got die space considerations, memory space considerations, cost, you know, uh, the the uh, 12 core, as I got have the wiki, the wiki chips page up, the 12 core IBM Power 8 die is 4.2 billion transistors and 649 millimeters square. Not all of that is core, but a lot of that is memory systems that are supporting all of those threads on those cores. So uh, I think this one has 90, has 128 megabytes of L4 per chip and 8 megs of L3 per core. So 12 times that, you're looking at 96 megs of L3 cache on that as well. So there's there's a lot of stuff that goes into it. I, I do think that there is likely, like the engineers I'm sure have looked at this. There are efficiency constraints of this. Does going from two to four threads per core improve efficiency? Yes, but it uh, lowers efficiency of die space and cost that way. IBM and the power architecture don't have to worry about cost as much. I mean, they do to some degree. But their customers are are reliable, and the architecture is built for a specific set of clients, and they know what they want and they know what they need, and these are not the kind of people who are pricing things out on CDW before they pick which server they're going to buy. It's not like you can easily move between one or the other. So the x86 system has more competition, which causes you to have different metrics in mind and KPIs. To, to pick as you're designing these things. But I will say I don't know the answer specifically, like the technical answer on why you wouldn't just do that, other than if it were just easy enough to just do it, everybody would just do it. There's, there's, there's additional cost and complexity as a result. But now I'm going to be doing more reading and figuring some of that, figuring some of that stuff out. So good on you for, I guess, soliciting, soliciting that. If anybody else has comments on it, welcome, welcome to, uh, to leave them in uh, the the comment section on the on the video here. Last question, because we've got to have one that involves Josh every time. Trolling for dollars asks, how does Josh, how often does Josh polish his head? Uh, and it's a question I've had nightmares about many times and uh, have never really wanted to answer. And I think it's it's a really personal thing. He probably is not going to want to get into it. But I mean, I've got a I've got a I've got a guess that it's every Wednesday. Right, he knows he's going to be on video on the podcast. He wants the shine off the overhead lights to be at their peak. Uh, so you know, little razor shave. I don't know. What do you put on bald heads? Pomade? You don't really do any. You don't need hair product. You're just a little wax, a little turtle wax, probably gets the job done. Um, but why don't you ask him again nicely on next week's episode? I don't really. I don't want to watch that one if that question comes up. So I don't want to know what Josh is going to say. Uh, so thank you, everybody, for, for hanging out and watching the mailbag this week. Again, if you have a question, please leave it in the comments of this video and or on the comments on PCPer.com. And again, we thank everybody for, for uh, their support on Patreon, patreon.com slash PCPer. And if you have a question, keep it succinct as you can. A couple of sentences, uh, not a few paragraphs in order to us, to, uh, Jim, to be able to, to parse these things and get them into, uh, in, into a doc for us. So thanks everyone for, uh, for supporting us and we'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.